Good evening and welcome to this another presentation from the Agency for Public Information. I am Nadia Slater. On this evening's program, Georgetown Diagnostic Center is set to open. We bring you part two in preparation leading up to that event. The Ministry of Education looks back at the rise in early childhood education. The Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court hosts a forum to buttress the legal services here. And the prison's rehabilitation program gets a boost. The details of these stories and more coming up. But first, let's go to our news desk with Ashisia Sam. Good evening and thank you very much for joining us for Newswatch for Thursday, May 24th, 2018. I'm Ishi Siasam. The government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines unequivocally condemns the unacceptable and unjustified killing of over 60 Palestinians, including an eight-month-old baby, and the injuring of hundreds more by the Israeli Defense Force on Monday, May 14th, 2018 in Palestinian territory. A release from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs said it is shameful that some allies internationally are seeking to defend the abhorrent actions of the Israeli authorities. In so doing, the Israeli authorities are making a mockery of international law, human rights and the, their claim to be acting on some yet to be discerned high principle. The release further stated that unnecessary and unjustified brutality cannot be justified. The indiscriminate shooting of the Palestinians happened while the new U.S. embassy was being opened with pompous disdain of settled international opinion. St. Vincent and the Grenadines has diplomatic relations with both Israel and the state of Palestine and is keen on the realization of a two-state solution rendered through meaningful dialogue between the Israelis and the Palestinians. The Department of Energy and the Prime Minister's Office, in collaboration with the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Geothermal Company Limited, hosted two public meetings over the weekend to share comprehensive information on the upcoming civil works phase of the geothermal project, including operations to date. The emphasis is on the people's well-being and the environmental impacts of the project on the people's lives. Managing Director, Head of Quality and Health, Safety and Environment, of Reykjavik Geothermal, Lofta Gisarasan, outlined the scope of work completed to date. Following civil designs have been completed, access road enhancements mainly around bends, laid down area for various rake materials and later a potential campsite for workers, a water pipeline from Rabaka River and water intake system, and Stantec has also completed the design of W1, the drill pad, that is going to be 100 meters by 100 meters in size. And also the design of the injection site, that measures about 80 meters by 80 meters, and it is about 500 meters downhill. The Energy Department is soliciting the public's continued support as the geothermal project progresses to the civil works required for drilling. These works, which are set to commence later this month, involve the development of required drilling infrastructure. The public meetings took place on Saturday, May 19th at the Georgetown Secondary School and Sunday, May 20th at the North Union Learning Research Center. CEO of the Carnival Development Corporation, Ashford Wood, is appealing to disc jockeys who are hired for rural carnival events to desist from expressing bias and to play the music of all artists. Woods noted that while the radio stations are playing the music of all artists, he has observed that the DJs who are hired for rural carnival events are expressing bias by playing the music of particular artists and the CDC cannot allow this to continue. The rural carnivals are supported by the CDC and we are not going to stand by and let carnival go back into the 1980s where people used to buy a road march and buy a this and buy a that. We, are, we have already started to have discussions with the rurals 
and we would be encouraging them to hire DJs who would be playing all the music. If you are hired and you cannot adhere to that, then you would simply be asked to step aside and a replacement DJ be provided. So it is not a threat. It is just something that we want to see corrected early. Wood said that thus far, great music have been produced for Vinci Mars this year. And finally, the Carnival Bands Association, CBA, will be staging its show Ignite on Saturday, May 26th at the Victoria Park. Saturday's event will run in two parts, a children aspect in the form of a mini fair and a soccer show and a mass band launch. Alvon Ali Kadogan of the Carnival Mass Bands Association said Saturday's event is dubbed Ignite as they recognize the importance to rebrand their showcase and they have decided to start with the schools. It will be a school's, what is a mini fair at Victoria Park from 5 in the afternoon until 8. You will see two school bands performing. You will also have some of the young and upcoming soccer artists performing. You will have uh, avenue dancers, uh, bouncing castle, face painting, ice cream, you name it. Put it like that, a children attraction in a form of a soca, a mini soca monarch at Victoria Park. And after that, you have mass bands parading the stage, 14 mass bands along with 25 soca artists will be performing at Victoria Park from nine in the afternoon until two the next morning, along with three top DJs. That's where we end News Watch for this evening. Do stay with us for the rest of our programming. I'm Ashi CSM, good evening. The following is a message from the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment. I brought plums for break today. Plums, where the salt? At school we don't eat fruits with salt. I don't think it is good. Look some salt. No, it's better without. Less salt, healthier life. A message from the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment. Welcome back. Preparations continue by health officials here for the opening soon of the George Young Diagnostic and Treatment Center. API's Director Jennifer Richardson tells us more in part two of our status report on the center. As preparations continue for the opening of the George Young Diagnostic and Treatment Center, Prime Minister Dr. Rav Gonsalves, accompanied by Minister of Health Luke Brown and other health officials, toured the grand facility to assess its readiness for opening. And from all reports, except for a few minor areas, which will be taken care of by the end of May 2018, the centre is ready for operation. The Prime Minister and his entourage toured every area of the facility, highlighting as they went along the many services that would be offered there. Among the many services that would be offered at the Diagnostic and Treatment Centre is treatment for cancer patients, both adults and children. This is the office for the consultant oncologist. In here, and the patient could be examined here and then go to the treatment rooms. This, this one here is a treatment room for, for children, pediatrics. This is for the... This is for children with, 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 um, with cancer. Okay. Notice we have a bed for them and we have a cot slump. Among the many other facilities that the center boasts is a pharmacy. The pharmacy is usually at the clinic, which is very accessible easily to people. But we're going to do repairs to that pharmacy. So this pharmacy from the beginning will serve for the time being the three facilities, the clinic, this and at the hospital. While on tour, we made a stop at the lab where technicians there were being trained to use certain specific pieces of equipment. Trainer Tamara Mez, the business coordinator for Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean for Rush Diagnostics, updated the Prime Minister on the training. This is our Pomacy 111. Uh -huh. It is for mid-size to 
small laboratories, uh -huh. as put. And it does all of the lipid profiles, all of the cholesterol. It does your electrolyte section. This little piece of equipment? This little piece of equipment. It does everything. It's semi-automated, walk away. They were trained, two Cubans and two people from Milton Cato were actually trained on this analyzer. And our second proud baby that we have is actually state-of-the-art hematology analyzer, which I can show you in the other one. So this is your systemic hematology analyzer. Yes. We're going to start training today. It's called the XN1000. It can actually do body fluids, which is great because you're in the dialysis unit. So you can take your arterial fluid and run it in the analyzer. It does full blood counts, everything. Magical. It's so magical. <laughs> it's yeah. also touch screen. Is there any like this in St. Vincent? And no. the LEDs? This is the first one? You are the first. You are the first. first. Uh, Barbados has two. We have like a 2000 setup. So now in, in QEH. In QEH, we just so they just got it. It's relatively new. Right. So actually, no. Well, people our size. One is enough. <laughs> yeah, this is perfect. 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 We have a similar at the hospital, but not as advanced as this. A it's similar one, but not as advanced. Yeah. <laughs> From the lab, it was then onto the intensive care unit. This is the intensive care unit. We have. The physical structure here to have four intensive care beds. We do not anticipate that immediately we'll need to operate more than one. But we will have the facilities to quickly operate all if needs be if we have a if we have a, a, a serious accident, a mass casualty. At at the Milton Gator Memorial Hospital which is a hospital with 200 beds. 200 beds at Milton Keto. Ideally, you should have five intensive care stations, but we now have four. No, we have two. No, and the additional one which we had put on. The, the, what you call the quote-unquote temporary one. Yes. So we, we, we need to have, but this is space which we have a problem there with. So we, this provides additional support. Sometimes what happens is this, you may have somebody in intensive care down at Milton Keto, and you need to have, the person is not yet, should, shouldn't yet come out of intensive care. But you have two, three, you have three of intensive care units, I mean facilities, spaces. You have to make up your mind if another one comes in which is so critical and serious that you have to move one of them from, from intensive care and put them for the hospital itself and give them a specialized kind of an environment. But we can always if need be transferred to here. As is well known, Cuban workers were integral in the setting up of the Georgetown Diagnostic and Treatment Center. However, their assistance went far beyond the setting up of the center, with Cuba donating several pieces of equipment which were also installed by Cubans. For example, the equipment to be used in the operating theater. The Cuban comrades installed this. This was sent by the Cuban government. Yes. This piece. This piece of equipment was given by the Cuban government also. And the Cuban technicians. This yes. is the man who installed this. He can tell you all about this. Yes. He can tell you about this equipment. Well, aquí tenemos un tipo de anestesia. This is the anesthetic machine. Electrocirugía. La lámpara del salón. Surgical lamp. Lámpara auxiliar. This is the auxiliary lamp. Para emergencias. El control de la lámpara. The control panel that control the light. So, la, this is la, a, la mesa única. This is the um, operating table. Following the tour, we caught up with Nurse Agatha Gittins' stay, ward manager at the Georgetown Diagnostic and Treatment Center, 
who updated us on the various types of services that will be offered at the medical center. The services offered are, we have nephrology, and nephrology entails both hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. We have laboratory services. So there, yes, there is a lab on the compound as well. We have ophthalmology and we cater for clinics and surgeries. There is ultrasound, EKG. We also offer radiology services. There would be a blood bank on the compound as well and the blood bank will assist for the operating theater for when, especially for orthopedic surgeries, because most of those cases, patients will require blood transfusion. So we have backup for that as well. We have intensive care unit, recovery. There also, there will be a pharmacist on site and we also offer physiotherapy. But to note, there will be oncology services as well. So, and we cater for both adults and children. Okay. Yes. Now, just so people don't get confused when they see this nice big center, um, someone told me it's not a hospital. It's a... It's a diagnostic center. It's not a hospital. So we people won't be coming in here to get their blood pressure check and all of that kind no, of stuff? No, all that will be done at the clinics. So your regular blood pressure checks, your DMO clinics will be done or on the other side. What we'll have here is the specialty areas that I spoke about before, and we also offer emergency services. So if you have cuts and bruises, when the center is open, then you will come on this side, and no longer at the Georgetown Hospital. Yes, you will come on this side. And we cater for the surgeries. But in the event that patients has to stay more than 24 hours, that will be done. We will accommodate them over at the Georgetown Smart Hospital. It is expected that residents of Georgetown, surrounded areas, and by extension the entire country, will take special care of this state-of-the-art facility, which is expected to significantly boost the delivery of healthcare services to Vincentians. Jennifer Richardson reporting for the Agency for Public Information. The government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines is offering tuition scholarships to nationals of this country for the 2018-2019 academic year. Conditions of the award. Awards are available for undergraduate and postgraduate program for studies primarily at the institutions within the Caribbean. Each scholarship covers the cost of tuition only for one academic year and will carry a maximum value of EC $25,000. New students must show proof of acceptance in a full-time program. Continuing students must provide evidence that they are in good academic standing. Award will be granted in accordance with national priority areas. Documents required. Copy of birth certificates, copies of academic certificates, copies of acceptance letters, and our most recent academic transcript. Application forms are available at the Service Commission's Department and must reach the Chief Personnel Officer by June 29, 2018. For more information, please visit our Facebook page at API SVG. You've got the nation's future in your hands With early childhood education administrators and supervisors 
We're lifting the standards throughout this land Ensuring high quality of service you provide We're lifting the ballet high standards be your guide Let us strive, let's get it right The nation's future is in your hands To learn more about the new Early Childhood Education Standards, please contact the Early Childhood Desk Curriculum Development Unit, Ministry of Education, at telephone number 4571466 or 4561111, extension 450. A message from the Ministry of Education and UNICEF. Thanks for staying with us. The Ministry of Education has paid particular attention to early childhood development over the past decade. They have introduced early childhood centers which are attached to primary schools and expanded the scope of learning. We bring you the second in a series of productions from the Ministry of Education as they examine early childhood education in this country. Education, good books. Education, not books. Education, good brain. Education. Historically in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, early childhood education rested in the hands of private providers, non-governmental organizations, churches, and community groups. The year 2009, however, ushered in a new era. In keeping with the thrust towards the achievement of universal access to early childhood care and development, the government embarked on a course to enhance early childhood education, especially for the benefit of rural and at-risk communities. To date, 11 government-operated preschools have been installed. They're located in Argyle, Bequay, Canaan, Edinburgh, Fairhall, Greggs, Langley Park, Mariaqua, Owea, Trumaca, and most recently, South Rivers. Apart from the Edinburgh Early Childhood Centre, these preschools are all attached to primary schools, and the focus is on providing access and quality service for the holistic development of all children. Early childhood education is at a critical juncture in our education sojourn here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It is an area that has generated a lot of interest and as a result of that it has evolved from 30 or so preschools some 25 years ago to some 125 preschools and the number is still expected to increase given the fact that a lot of people have caught on to the idea that the foundational years of a child is extremely important. Since 2009, about 60% of preschools throughout the country have improved their standard of operation. But there's still a lot of work to be done, ranging from the opening of a preschool to the administering of proper care. In order to begin an early childhood center, you need to have first of all a location, a location that is free from any encumbrances. What do I mean by that? There should not be any garbage heap next to the place that you are going to choose. Then you're not going to take a place that is not enclosed because the safety of the children is critical. We want to be able to establish a safe and nurturing environment. Do you have the furniture that is necessary? So that the children can feel comfortable is that location cramped or spacious so that a child can move around do you have an outdoor facility because children need outdoor play so that their gross motor skills can be developed is there anything in the indoor environment so that their fine motor skills can be developed the public health unit should have visited that location to ensure that it is environmentally safe and the children are not going to be harmed in any way if they start attending your early childhood center. Currently, some privately owned early childhood institutions are not meeting the standards of operation expected and accepted regionally and internationally. Hence, the government, through the Ministry of Education, is in the process of enacting a set of standards and regulations in accordance with the Education Acts of 2006. One of the critical areas that has impacted the effective operation of our early childhood center is the lack of standards and regulations. It is very unfortunate that for the last eight or so years, 
we have been struggling to have the early childhood standards passed through the cabinet so that we could really monitor and enforce the level of operation that meets international standards. As it is right now, we can only advise preschool operators that these are the benchmarks that you need to accomplish. However, there is nothing in place so far to allow us to enforce that. And this is really unfortunate because standards and regulations ensure that people toe the line, ensure that persons do what they're supposed to do. When the early childhood standards have passed, then we can envision the quality of operations will certainly improve. Despite the challenges, exciting times are ahead in the early childhood subsector. Almost 70% of practitioners have had some type of exposure to early childhood pedagogy through in-service training and the establishment and strengthening of the early childhood degree program at the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Community College. A significant number of practitioners have also been certified through the University of the West Indies Open Campus. The steady growth in numbers of students enrolling in these programs reflects the growing interest and recognition of the value of early childhood education. We are quite aware that we have to evolve even as education is evolving. In the future, we are going to look at the early childhood curriculum. This is going to be revised sometime between the next two years and it is going to be geared in such a way that it is domesticated to meet the needs of the Vincentian child. Additionally, we have to pursue inclusive education. We cannot hide our heads under the sand and pretend that they're not children who may possess one or two developmental problems. If we are thinking in terms of education for all, then we must be willing to accept every child. So that is another area that we are going to be looking to offer training in. I end by saying, as I always like to do, let us let our children enjoy their childhood days. Too often we make children appear older than they are because we want them to grow up so fast. Please, the United Nations says that a child is between 0 to 18. And I urge all of you, to let her children know that there's a time for adulthood. I've spoken to a lot of people who wish they could go back to those years once again. Let them enjoy it while they can and let us make it meaningful and as enjoyable as possible. This has been another episode of Education Alive, a production of the media units of the Ministry of Education and I am Marla Nanton. If you can believe this... Why can't you believe this? Uncle tried to make me have sex. Some mothers don't believe their own children when they say they've been sexually abused and they don't report it. Remember, if anyone asks to see or touch their private parts, touches them inappropriately, shows them or forces them to touch one's private parts, has sex with them, shows them pornographic material, or deliberately lets them hear or see the act of sex, then it is sexual abuse. Believe your child and report the sexual abuse. For more information about child abuse, contact these agencies. This message brought to you by UNICEF and this station. If you're just joining us, you're viewing a presentation from the Agency for Public Information. The University of the West Indies and the Judicial Education Institute of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court is currently hosting a one-week mediation training workshop. Participants will receive certificates at the end of the forum. And as the API's Sheridan Lewis explains, this will help to improve the services offered by the legal system. Mediation plays a vital role within the judicial system and offers all parties involved the opportunity to settle disputes in an amicable fashion. With this reality, this route of settlement is being encouraged and to further facilitate this process, a mediator's training workshop funded by the Government of Canada 
commenced here on Monday, 21st May, and ends on Saturday, May 26th. The collaborative efforts of the University of the West Indies and the JEI of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court is geared at offering persons from differing career paths an opportunity to learn more about mediation, which ultimately will see those completing the 40 hours of training obtaining certificates as local mediators. Her Ladyship, the Honorable Justice Esco Henry, representative of the judiciary, pointed out the benefits of mediation, but first addressed the topical issue of vigilante justice. Vigilante justice, although a rare occurrence in our communities, when it raises its ugly head, the fallout is usually devastating to all parties, even those of us who are not involved in the scenarios which play out on the screens. Self-help relief comes at the expense of stable communities and is often resorted to out of frustration, out of concern that the court system moves at too slow a pace and out of desperation that the end result of a trial will not address all of the issues and the lingering resentment and hurt that parties to conflict bring to the court. The formal court system of advocacy is traditionally adversarial. Traditional and inherent incidents to such a system include the reality that the outcome really ends in a draw where each party leaves satisfied. What in fact happens, and you're going to hear this over the next five days repeatedly, is that one party leaves with the spoils and the other party leaves losing everything, even having to pay costs to the winning party. Where there are two parties only, but there are cases you would be aware where you have several parties, but invariably one wins and the other loses. Mediation, on the other hand, offers a compromise resolution where each procures a result with which they are content, with which they can move on a pace with their lives. Mediation also addresses the emotions behind the conflict and it allows parties, if it is conducted in the way it is designed to be conducted, it allows parties to arrive at a place, a place of peace. Essentially, the collective control of the outcome of mediation is in the hands of the parties, as opposed to be in the hands of a single adjudicator in our system, the judge. Mediation is also a simpler and more user-friendly process than litigation. There are very few rules in mediation. You will learn about them over the next few days. There are no procedural and evidential rules which hamper so many of us and which can be quite difficult for the average person to understand. The atmosphere at mediation is more relaxed generally than in a court setting, and the parties are at liberty to and often craft flexible and creative arrangements which bring an end to their disputes. Francis Compton is the Regional Mediation Coordinator of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court and highlighted how this form of justice is performing in the OECS. As you may know, St. Vincent is not the only territory with the mediation program, all nine states and territories within this OECS region have adopted mediation. And it is working well. And even if you have not been hearing about mediation in St. Vincent, mediation has been working well in St. Vincent. We have had some difficulties with our program in St. Vincent, but my visit here this week, as you may have heard, I was here um, since Wednesday, 
and I believe I hit the ground running and I have been able to have a number of meetings, the results of which have been extremely promising. We at the OECS Supreme Court are looking very seriously at the day when we can introduce compulsory mediation in the OECS. And your training today begins that process. So by having more persons trained in St. Vincent, we will have a larger cadre of persons on the roster of Court Connected Mediators. And hopefully we will be able to do a number of things expected by the judiciary here in St. Vincent to make the access to justice more pleasant for persons who have disputes in this land. President of the Bar Association, Ms. Rene Batiste, stressed that the utilization of mediation is fundamental and should be executed more often. As president of the Bar Association, twice we made mention of this at the opening of the law term in 2015 and 2016, that we would like to see more use being made of the mediation, court mediation services. I was very pleased to learn that at least one third of the current court mediators turned up to the refresher course last week. And I am indeed overwhelmed by the number of lawyers in the room, even though there are only two male lawyers in the room. I'm happy to see persons from other professions also being enticed by this training and answer the call to come forward to assist us in this process. Furthermore, from the perspective of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, we are fortunate in being able to start that process in St. Vincent. It's different from mediation, but when a group of us learned about the amount of work that was available for the process of arbitration, it became sort of necessary to introduce that as well to a wider Vincentian audience. Sometimes we are not aware of the amount of commercial activity in our own jurisdiction, and we have to import arbitrators. So this would also be available, more training. We did one session already, Justice Lance, who was with us for a period, she was involved. I think Justice Henry almost made it that day, but unfortunately she had to preside over some matters. And we're hoping to be able to offer that later in the year, another course in commercial arbitration. Even though in the, what I've noticed is that it has been increasingly used in the commercial sector, especially very large matters, and in the shipping sector, the maritime sector. Attorney General John D. Martin outlined the legal framework that facilitates the mediation process to be applicable within this jurisdiction. The law has applied to us since 2003, almost 15 years ago. Under the practice direction, the court has the power of its own volition to refer a matter to mediation if it thinks that this is the proper course. The parties to a dispute, whether in person or through counsel, may, however, choose mediation through the court prior to the court deciding to refer the matter. The law has made it compulsory that the parties to the dispute attend mediation. Failure to attend could result in the mediator issuing a certificate of non-compliance and, non and the party may incur costs the party who failed to attend that is. For the process to work, however, mediators must be trained and their training must be recognized by the court. And that is why you are here. Facilitator of the training workshop, and Diaz outlined what the week's activities entail. You're going to be entering into a week 
of solid training. And I need, needed to sensitize you of this before we actually commence the training itself. The, the university's mediation training program is approved by the Mediation Board of Trinidad and Tobago. And as a result, we, ha we have to follow some very serious, strict guidelines in order to ensure that when we give you your certificate, it is in compliance with that program. One of the first requirements is that you complete a mandatory 40 hours. I'm saying that to say that I know it's tight and I want to commend you really for taking your holiday and spending it with us today. The API also spoke with participants of the mediation workshop. I expect to learn about the methods, the various procedures that they employ in mediation. Listening to the presentations this morning, at first I was getting a little confused because some speakers seem to be using mediation and arbitration interchangeably. But coming towards the end of the presentations, I think a distinction was made because I've always had, you know, a different perspective. So I expect to learn a whole lot and even more importantly to see to what extent I could implement what I learn in order to make a difference with regard to um, preventing litigation, helping people to find a pathway towards reconciliation or conciliation. Well, I guess in my field it would expose me a bit more to the real world in terms of what is happening in relation to legal issues, um, disputes or settlements that could be easier done, you know, via a common mean. The importance of this too, I would expect that at least publicly there be a bit more awareness to this method, that persons could use this method as opposed to the normal legal process which would be more expensive and more time consuming. What line of work are you in? Well actually I'm an employee of the National Insurance Services Compliance Manager currently. So I'm exposed to a lot of um, disputes, specifically to NIS. Not that I'm saying that this would assist me directly in terms of getting those results, but at least it would put me in a position to better understand, you know, um, others' perspective on issues. We would have used uh, this process before in an issue. In an issue, we would have used this process before, and which was done successfully. And I must say, it's a means of. Um, it, it saved us a lot of time, other than the court process, which we're so accustomed to. And we just uh, wish a person, other persons could use this means also. Reporting for the API, I am Sheridan Lewis. As a young boy, I used to go on the beaches with other friends and catch turtles, and they come to lay. And for me, it was fun and a means of survival as well. But as you can see, I stand in between two outboard motors. I choose mechanic as a living and as I joined the Union Island Environmental Attackers and I went on the beach and see the procedures of a turtle coming all the way from Europe or to Lee. I think it was a sad mistake I have made. Right now, I take it up as a job to protect the turtles and encourage others not to kill the turtles anymore. And that's my contribution. Welcome back. Several pieces of equipment were handed over on Wednesday, May 23rd, 2018 to the Superintendent of Prisons, Brenton Charles. The equipment included sewing machines, computers, and carpentry tools, and will be used to augment the rehabilitation programs at the prison. The sourcing of the equipment was made possible through a project funded by the European Union and the Regional Security System. The items were handed over at the ceremony at the Foreign Affairs Conference Room. Kesha Woodley was there and has this report.
Welcome to the RSS EU 10th EDF program handing over ceremony. Today, we are happy and we are thankful for the equipment that you see to your left there, which includes some sewing machines, computers, and carpenters' tools. I know that we will be it will be of great use to the prison and it will help in the continuing of the rehabilitation program that we have going on for the inmates. In his opening remarks, Superintendent of the Prisons, Mr. Brenton Charles, thanked the RSS and the European Union for their support. Everyone here this morning, you're here for a reason. You're here because in some way or the other, you have partnered with us to uh, bolster our rehabilitation program one way or another. And uh, we are grateful that you came out in, in, in such large numbers, really. Um, it shows us that you are with us, that you support what we are doing, and we would continue to crave your support and indulgence in the future. But today it's about the regional security system and what they are bringing to us here. I think it's last year I met Ria in Barbados and uh, she said, I have some things for you. And it, it's, not, it's, it's not just about St. Vincent, it's about all the OECS countries. Um, this, this is happening. And uh, quite true to her word, in, in January of 2018, um, she was on the line with me and we were discussing having the equipment um, shipped to St. Vincent. To donate this package of equipment to Her Majesty's Prison Saints and Visit the And we wish you well and success, mighty success in your rehabilitative initiatives in the prison. Thank you. Bye bye. Mr. Charles commended all those groups and persons who have gone beyond their duties to support the staff of the prisons with their rehabilitative programs. I also want to make mention of the Ministry of Education, the adult education in particular. Um, quite recently, we had some discussions on where the Ministry of the, the Adult Ed can fit in to our rehab, uh, rehabilitation scheme. And uh, the, the director have assigned three persons to work along with us to build programs um, so we could better serve our inmates. We need everybody, everybody who call themselves a prison officer, a member of Her Majesty's service serving in the prison must lend their hand to the rehabilitation of our inmates. I'm calling now. I hope that people will take heed. Again, I, I want to really thank Commander, Lef Lieutenant Commandant Roberts, and I want him to convey our, our gratitude to the RSS and, of course, to the European Union for their, their really kind gesture. Lieutenant Brian Roberts of the RSS stated, The RSS has taken its duties a step further in an attempt to curtail inmates from becoming repeat offenders. In addition to successes with drug supply and reduction to interdiction, the RSS hopes to contribute to peace and stability by focusing on reducing recidivism in our subregion. This project on the 10th EDF European Development Fund represents our first steps our engagement with correctional facilities to strengthen rehabilitation initiatives. In our, in our acknowledgement of the role of recidivism in national security paradigms, in the first instance, we are here today to present to the government and people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines some equipment that we believe can assist in strengthening your rehabilitative um, initiatives. 
the computers and the other equipment that we would have, you would have heard earlier, the saws, the, um, the sewing machines, etc. All right, will hopefully improve the technical and vocational training conducted in your correctional facilities. It is hoped that the successful utilization of this equipment will help to develop um, the skills of your inmates and also give them better opportunities for some sort of employment after they would have left the institution. Featured speaker, Deputy Commissioner of the Royal St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force, Mr. Frankie Joseph, said the mission of Her Majesty's Prisons is to rehabilitate inmates and to make every effort to reintegrate inmates into society. Regardless of the rehabilitation process that we have in prison, if the society on the release of the prisoners is not receptive and if they do not allow for a second chance, then we will really be spinning our tabs in mud, in whatever rehabilitation programs that we have in prison. Because at the end of the day, on release of these prisoners, having gone through that very aggressive rehabilitation program, if they are being torn away by society, if the businesses fail to give them a second chance, if the, the businesses fail to hire them to take a risk to test the rehabilitation process, is a program that we have in prison. If they fail to do that, then most of the inmates on release from prison will be left with no alternative than to re-offend and they find themselves back into prison. One inmate of the prisons is grateful for the training he has undergone whilst in prison. He made a call to young men, especially to live a life free of crime. I'm now in prison for the past six years, which is from since the 4th of June 2012. And since I'm in jail, I am I has undergoing a lot of training to benefit to myself. I'm one of the inmate who took, who graduate in the parenting skills program from Belize. Even though I'm in Kingston, I used to go to Belize for the training, and it's helped me a lot to help out with the situation when I go back out, that I could be a better father to my children and a better husband to my wife, because without a father in the home, the whole family will just go apart and Many young men today are in prison because of the choices that we make. Sometimes people will say it's friends we follow, but um, we have a mind of our own. And if we develop certain things and we put it into practice, I believe the society could be a better place for it and for our children. Because knowing what I'm going through, knowing knowing the, um, what I'm going through in prison and the program that was offered to me in the prison by the superintendent and other officers, it benefited me a lot. I'm now undergoing um, a mechanic training in the prison, which I has never learned, I has never learned mechanic outside. Since I came into the prison, I learned mechanic, and it's a very benefit to me. So when I go back out, I could be a mechanic. I could walk, even though I don't get work with other industry. I could work on my own to be a self-employment to help my family and stay out of prison. We are better individual in society when we leave the prison. We can, I can show you that I am not the same person that they see leave society and come into prison. I am a better person to go back out into society to teach young people about crime because I want to teach the young people about the problem that took me into the prison. That is not right. My final comment is that I'm warning all young men, please try and stay out of prison because it, it is not a nice place to be. Even though the people seeing we in prison, it's not a nice place. And people will say, oh, you're a jail man, you're a jail bird, you're an ex -can. But I want to show people that we are still human beings and we are still somebody's children. Thank you. Reporting for the Agency for Public Information, 
I am Keisha Woodley. Mommy, mommy, can I have a snack, please? Sissy, mommy, real busy right now. Just take a snack from the counter. No, mommy, that's having too much salt in it. Can I have a fruit, please? That's an interesting choice. But where did you learn that? The people on Hellwood. No, mommy, you want to kill me with high blood pressure? Hellwood says whatever salt you eat for the whole day should not be more than one teaspoon, and that is just for adults, you know. Foods may contain more salt than you think. Reduce salt intake. Stay tuned for our notice board segment up next. The public is asked to take note of the following announcement. Request for expression of interested individual consultant, agribusiness monitoring and evaluation specialist and administrative assistant OECS Agriculture Competitiveness Project. The Government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines has received financing from the International Development Association of the World Bank to implement the OECS Regional Agriculture Competitiveness Project Agricom. The project will be implemented by the Ministry of Agriculture through a Project Implementation Unit, PIU, with responsibility for overall coordination and supervision. The primary responsibility of the Agribusiness Monitoring and Evaluation Specialist will be to monitor and to assist with the management of the implementation of all sub-projects and to coordinate the delivery of the monitoring and evaluation outputs of the project. The primary responsibility of the administrative assistance will be to provide routine administrative and secretarial support activities to the project manager and the project staff of the PIU. For further information, visit our Facebook page at API SVG. That's all the time we have on this evening's presentation. We hope we kept you informed and entertained for the past hour. The API presentation continues this Saturday with our magazine program, Inside Story. I'm Nadia Slater and I'll see you then.